So here are some facts that you're probably well aware of. We have 100 billion neurons in the brain, 10 times more glial cells. Our brain is five to seven times larger than it should be compared to other mammals. It costs more energy per, uh, relative to the, to, the, to the body, like George and Todd were just discussing, and I'll, I'll come back to that in the end. So uh, the human brain represents only 2% of the body mass, and yet it consumes 20 to 25% of our energy budget. And we have the most developed cortex in ter terms of relative size. So compared to a number of other mammals, we are special. And um, so that's what I'll go back to. What I'm, what I'm going to do is show you how knowing how many, knowing the numbers of cells that compose brains of different species and our own, how that shows us that we're actually not that special. But let me get there. So this is what we're um, interested in, in in the lab, diversity. Mammalian brains vary by, oh, I need this. But mammalian brains vary by over 100,000 times in size, from the smallest insectivore brains to, to the largest ones we know. Um, and when I started in this area a few years ago, there seem to be several consensus in, in the literature. One of them is what I've referred to. It's the relative expansion of the, the cerebral cortex in humans. So if you look at the relative size of the cortex, so what percentage it comprises relative to the in, uh, entire brain, you see that the larger the, the brain, each point here is one species, the, the, the larger the cerebral cortex tends to be in, in, percent, in percent size, and this is us here. And that's even though the, the, the cortex tends to increase in size almost linearly with the, with the cerebellum. And um, I'll come back to that um, in a little bit. But uh, here we have this trend in the relative, uh, relative expansion of the cerebral cortex, which is one of the, the major reasons why brain evolution has come to be colloquially compared to, uh, equated to expansion of the cerebral cortex. And that's one of the, the things that I'll come back to. These were, these were the other consensus in the, in the literature. Larger brains, and here I should actually say larger cerebral cortices, have lower neuronal densities, which implies that they have larger neurons, which intuitively also makes sense. Larger brains should be made of more neurons, and, and these neurons on average become bigger. And as they become bigger, supposedly the glia to neuron ratio, so how many glial cells you have to every neuron in your brain, also um, increases, the, that ratio also increases. So let me point out to you that each, each individual dot in these plots is one species, and um, I don't have the mouse. And um, here you have all sorts of mammals mixed together, mice and primates and cows and rabbits, and the, so the underlying assumption behind these scaling studies has usually been that all brains scale the same, meaning that big brains are enlarged versions of smaller brains and, uh, and vice versa. So um, if, you, if you just examine that, if you just consider that assumption for a little bit, and you accept the, the notion, which I think is the working hypothesis of most of us here, that the brain is made of functional units and those functional units are neurons, then if a brain has more of those units, if a brain has more neurons, it should have more computational abilities. So that implies that larger brains should have more neurons and hence should be more cognitive able, however you define that. Um, now, that also means that if you have two brains of about the same size, if all mammalian brains are scaled up or scaled down versions of the same basic plan, then these, uh, these two animals with brains of about the same size should have about the same number of neurons, which means that they should have about similar cognitive abilities. And then we can compare, uh, we can do um, a number of interesting and fun comparisons. This is my favorite. You, the, the owners of these two brains here, uh, these are brains of about 400 grams relatively large, so you might expect these two animals to be relatively uh, comparable in what they're able to do cognitively, and yet one is a cow and the other is a chimp. And um, every time I show this, this slide in a talk, there's a big uh, discussion in the end about how smart or dumb cows actually are. Um, we can get the, into that later, and uh, of course, it's, it is possible that cows have this incredibly rich internal 
philosophical life that's so rich that they choose not to tell us about it. But um, um, I, I, I'd rather think that we eat them so they cannot be all that smart. But anyway, I think this drives the, the, the point that it, this is not a straightforward comparison. And the, just assuming that brains of a similar size are made the same way, have the same number of neurons, is, um, is, a compare, is an assumption that doesn't go a long way. And of course, the most vexing comparison is this here. Our brain is by far not the largest one on the block. Elephants have brains that are about the size of, of my arm. And, um, and uh, so we would, of course, there's no denying that, so we tend to go with, okay, their brain is bigger, but ours is better. We have a relatively larger cortex, whatever that means physiologically. We're more encephalized, meaning our brain is much larger than it should be compared to the body size that we have. We take longer to mature, or um, we have a number of other differences, some genetic, some physiological, that have been coming up. But um, anyway, the, the overall idea here is, is the same, and all based on this assumption that all brains are made the same. So our brain should have fewer neurons than um, an elephant brain, for instance. So, but if you consider these issues in the light of evolution, what, you, what you're forced to realize is that there's not one single trend in, in evolution. Uh, large brains have not appeared just once, but several times in, 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 the, in most of the different radiations in, um, in, in mammals. So what we're interested in doing is comparing, is finding out what brains are made of what is the relationship between brain size and how many neurons or, or non-neuronal cells go into that brain? And what do we learn about how different animals behave and how uh, cognitive abilities eventually, how that relate not, not, not just to brain size, which we know it doesn't really, but uh, eventually to numbers of neurons. So to, to get at that, we needed to first be able to determine what different brains are made of. Stereology has been around for a while, but uh, it really didn't seem to me to be a very time efficient way to get at that. So um, some years ago, we developed our own method in the lab to be able to count cells directly and with as few assumptions as possible, and most important of all, in a way that was absolutely not dependent on the size of the structures that we were looking at. So the, the name of the method is the isotropic fractionator that was published in 2005. And um, it's, in essence, it, cons it, it consists of turning your favorite part of the brain or the entire brain into a soup of free nuclei, which you then can count. And the, the, basic, the basis of the, the, the method, the basic assumption is that as long as every cell has one and only one cell nucleus, then we don't have to count cells. We can count cell nuclei. And the, the beauty of counting cell nuclei is that the heterogeneity of the tissue lies in the distribution of the cells. So if you can get rid of the cells, if you can dissolve mechanically in detergent the cell membranes of all the cells, you end up with a suspension of free nuclei. And, um, and the reason that the nuclei remain intact is that you, you start out with paraformaldehyde fixed and actually very well fixed tissue. So that the nuclear membranes are, since they're highly proteic, they're well fixed, so they're very, very resistant to the mechanic dissociation in detergent. And once you have this suspension of free nuclei, you actually have all the free, nucle the free cell nuclei that once composed the tissue, you can just shake that suspension, and you end up with a, with a homogeneous suspension now of free nuclei. And um, the beauty of this is that any sample that you take out of this now homogeneous suspension of nuclei is representative of the whole. So you can stain these nuclei with DAPI, go to the microscope, and in a few minutes you, you determine the density of nuclei in the suspension. Just multiply that by the volume which you chose uh, what would be the volume of your suspension, and you know how many cells your original tissue had. And then you can, from, from there, you can take samples and use immunocytochemistry to Nguyen, which is a universal uh, nu nuclear neuronal cell marker. And that gives you, in a few hours, that tells you what proportion
of all the cell nuclei are neuronal. So you can have your direct estimate of how many neurons and by subtraction how many non-neuronal cells composed your original tissue. And as if, if you have any other nuclear uh, expressed markers, you can, you, you can also use that instead to get your numbers. So this is uh, what we have, the species that we have applied these, this, this method to so far. It's 38 species, including us. And um, let me just give you an overview of what we, what we found. So if you compare the size, this is whole brain now. If you compare the size, so the mass of the whole brain, to the number of neurons that compose that whole brain, the first thing that you notice here is that it, it is not a homogeneous distribution. Um, each dot is one single species. The species are color-coded by order, so green will always be rodents, primates will always be red here, and we also have insectivores and coroptera. So what you see here is that, and this is a, this is a double log plot, so the differences that you find in the, in the slopes here are actually enormous differences across these orders. So let me, um, let me just concentrate here on rodents and primates to give you an idea of what the, the different slopes mean. So if you look at rodents first, you see that Larger brains are indeed made of larger numbers of neurons, but the relationship here is a power function that has an exponent of 1.6, which is pretty enormous. What this means is that a rodent brain that gains 10 times more neurons becomes not just 10 times larger, it becomes about 45 times larger. And that's in contrast to the what I'll call here the scaling rule that applies to primates. So larger primate brains are also made of, of more neurons, but this scaling exponent here is very close to one, which means that if a primate gets 10 times more neurons, its brain becomes exactly 10 times larger, not 45. So rodents have, compared to primates, rodents have a very inflationary way of adding neurons to the brain, and that's um, the, um, and that's because as they get more neurons, the average size of the neurons of the neuron also in increases. So, and here to the right, you can see that there's also um, a relationship that we can describe between how large the body is and how many neurons the brain has. And you also see that the, the difference is the difference is there, and it's actually even larger between rodents and primates. So, um, rodents gain body mass much faster than they, gain, than they gain neurons compared to, to primates. Now, the next question, of course, is how do we compare to, to these animals? So we had to first determine how many neurons our, our brain is made of. That was the master's thesis work of Federico in the, in the lab. And um, so in, this is an average of four um, male, brain, uh, male brains uh, for men who died of non-neurological -neuro re uh, reasons. And uh, on average, we found 86 billion neurons. Let me just add that not a single one of these people got even close to 100 billion neurons. The average is 86. And uh, about as many non-neuronal cells. So non-neuronal cells include endothelial cells, astrocytes, oligodendrocytes, all the other cells in the, in the brain. But we, we assume for now that most, the vast majority of them will be glial cells, not endothelial cells. Let me just draw your attention to something that I'll come, I'll come back to. Even though the cerebral cortex does amount to the vast majority of the brain mass, 82%, it only has 19% of all the brain neurons. The majority of brain neurons are here in the cerebellum, 72% of them, even though the cerebellum only represents 10% of, um, of brain mass. And um, so if, if you think this is 86, that's close enough to 100. 14 billion neurons is not a very large difference. Let me just point out to you that that's a, an entire baboon brain, or about <coughs> probably about half a gorilla brain. So that's, that's how far 86 is from 100 billion neurons. And this, it's, this is a very important number, too, that this is not 10 times more uh, glial cells than neurons. And I'll come back to that in a little bit. So all right, human brains have, on average, 86 billion neurons. What does this tell us about how we compare to other animals? So we can go back to those, um, we can go back to these relationships here to these scaling rules and just solve these equations for 86 billion neurons and that tells us um, what size a, a generic rodent with 
86 billion neurons would have and what size a generic primate with 86 billion neurons would have. And so we find that a generic rodent with 86 billion neurons would have a brain of 36 kilos. That is an eight-year-old child. The entire child is brain. Um, let me just add to that that's not physiologically plausible, the, the estimated limit for how large a brain can be before it collapses under its, its own body, its own weight, is ten, about 10 kilos, um, which is the size of a blue whale brain. And uh, so that implausible generic rodent brain with 86 billion neurons would inhabit a body about the size of a blue whale. 89 tons. So here, we, we, with this very simple mathematical estimate, we, we learn a few things. We learn that, um, well, first, we are not rodents. This is not us. We also learn that if this generic rodent with these many <coughs> neurons ever existed, it, um, it, would have to be, it would have to live underwater and would be the size of a, of a blue whale. Um, we also learned that we don't have to really worry about very large rodent mutations because despite their big size, they probably would not have a whole lot of neurons in their brain just because the brain uh, adds neurons in this highly inflationary way. So, okay, we are not rodents, big surprise there. But, um, so let me, I'm, I'm just, I'm only half kidding here. Too often we are compared to other mammals in general. And I think there's a very important point here to be made that that comparison is not fair. We are not large rodents, so we, if we are built in, a very, in an entirely different way from, say, rodents, then we should not be compared to what we should be like if we were just a skilled up rodent. So anyway, what about a generic primate with 86 billion neurons? So according to those scaling rules, this generic primate would have a brain of about 1,200 grams, sounds about right, and a body of 60-something kilos also sounds about right. So I'm a primate, and all of you are. So uh, what, this, what the, the, these matching numbers mean is that our, the human brain, our brain, is built to the image of other primate brains, at least in what concerns numbers of neurons. Our brain is a scaled up primate brain in exactly the same way that other primate brains have been built over the years following the exact same rules in proportionality between how many neurons go into brain areas and how large the brain is. So just going back to that same image that you saw before, this is us here, right on the mark. Um, and if you break that down into different brain structures, then you find that uh, we also conform to, the, um, to the, the rules that apply here, to the cerebral cortex for primates, the cerebellum for primates, and here the remaining brain structures. So, now, what about that uh, relative scaling of the cortex? What about the relative enlargement of the cortex? Which is, this is, this is us here, and uh, you find that the, the, even though it looks like the cerebellum and the cortex scale linearly, the, the, the difference here, even though it's very small, it's that the 0.04 in that exponent is enough that over four orders of magnitude, that translates into a difference from 60-something percent to 80-something percent. And uh, now, the, the, important, the importance of determining what the relative uh, expansion of the cortex actually means is that this relationship between cortex, cerebral cortex and, and cerebellum has been used to make entirely different arguments based on the very same data. And this is how it goes. If you look at absolute volume of the cortex and absolute volume of the cerebellum and you find that they are, for let's say practical matters, a linear relationship here, you would call this a coupled scaling of cortex and cerebellum in size and that would argue uh, you could use that to argue for a functional codependence and, uh, and therefore uh, correlated evolution of these two structures. Now, if instead you consider that it's, no, no, it's the relative size of the cortex that actually matters, which is what the, our literature has been doing for, for, uh, uh, for many years, then this looks very much like a cortex just leaving the cerebellum behind. So this has been used as, uh, as evidence of a functional independence between these two structures and actually as evidence of, uh, of a, a relative uh, 
takeover of the cerebral cortex. Um, it just come, it would come to dominate function. So the question is, does the relative enlargement of the cortex actually, if, if it is to be functionally relevant, does it reflect a relative enrichment of cortical neurons? Meaning, does a relatively larger cortex also have relatively more of all brain neurons? That would be the expectation that would support this um, argument here. And now that we have the, the, the numbers, we can do this comparison, and the answer is no. So this is relative size of the cortex as percent of brain mass, and this is relative number of neurons in the cortex as per percent of all, cortical, of all brain neurons. And what the first thing that you, that you notice is that uh, there's nothing that looks like the, like the, cor the correlation that you would expect here. Um, there's actually no, um, no correlation. This is us here, occupying not a very special position at all. But um, so the, the enlarged human cortex, the relatively larger human cortex, does not have relatively more neurons compared to the whole brain. Actually, what happens instead is that now if you look at numbers of neurons directly, what you find is that across these 28 species here in this plot, the number of neurons in the cerebellum varies fairly tightly with the number of neurons in the cortex across all these species. In what looks for, and this is us here, so um, there, it, this, is, uh, this relationship can be described as linear, so overall there's about four more neurons added to the cerebellum for every neuron that's added to the cortex, so that keeps the relationship stable, um, such that in the end, cortex and cerebellum gain neurons together. So why the relative expansion of the cerebral cortex? And uh, the, the answer probably lies in the white matter. The white matter of the cerebral cortex increases in volume faster than the gray matter. Um, this is a study that we published um, two years ago. And you, can, you, you also find that the, the, the size of the white matter scales faster than, uh, than, it, than, the, than the brain, the, the, than, than the gray matter gains neurons. It, it also gains um, non-neuronal cells faster than it, than it gains neuro, uh, neurons. And the, the cerebellar white matter doesn't increase as fast. So the overall, the, if you plot the size of the, the cerebral cortex in the cerebellum as a function of the number of neurons that they, that they have, this is just for primates, you find, again, that very, very small difference in the exponents which is just enough to explain why over four orders of magnitude you have that, that relative increase in the size of the, of the cortex. Now, what does happen if you now consider that the cerebral cortex and cerebellum are gaining neurons coordinately, is that if you, can, if you consider the, the, the joint number of neurons that they have, you, you realize that um, as, the, as brains increase in size, more and more of uh, all of its neurons are indeed concentrated jointly in the cortex and cerebellum. So, um, and if you plot that as a, as a ratio of the, the number of neurons that you have in all the other structures, so that's brain stem and the, the diencephalon and striatum, you find that larger cortices, and this is primates here, larger, sorry, larger brains do have more and more neurons in the cerebral cortex and cerebellum jointly relative to these, to these subcortical structures. So there, that's uh, reasonable, uh, that's, that goes very well with the idea that larger brains do, uh, they are indeed gaining, let's say, neurons that could do things other than just simply deal with bodily functions. So this here could be the, the, the basis for the um, larger, let's say, complexity and flexibility of behavior of larger brains. So this is neurons. Now, what about the non-neuronal cells? So let me, I, I show you this again, just, to, just so you can keep this image in your mind. So this is, once more, this is how the size of the different brain structures, just cerebral cortex, cerebellum, and the remaining structures, how that varies as a function of number of neurons. So you see that this relationship, the neuronal scaling relationships, are particular to mammalian orders and to brain structures. Now, if you, pl if you look at, at the same relationship, but to the numbers of non-neuronal cells, this is what you find. It's remarkably constant, especially if you consider that this is four orders of magnitude. 
30 entirely different species, four orders of mammals, and yet the size of a structure, if you tell me the size of a structure in any brain area in any of these mammalian species, I can, I can predict with a fair amount of, uh, of um, certainty how many non-neuronal cells it's going to have. And we are, we are mixed in here in this, in this relationship. So neur uh, neurons scale in very diverse ways, non-neuronal cells, on the contrary, seem to be added in pretty much the same manner to the different structures and different species and different mammalian orders. So what, since one varies and the, the other doesn't, it it's, should be intuitive that when you look at one over the other, so non, the ratio between non-neuronal cells and neurons, which is an approximation here of the glia to neuron ratio, what you find is that there is no constant relationship between the glia to neuron ratio and the size of the structures as it used to be, um, to be believed. Now, if you plot, if you look at exactly the same ratio, not as a function of brain mass, but as a function of neuronal density, then everything lines up again. So across all species, across all structures, the larger the neuronal density, the smaller the glia to neuron ratio meaning that the, probably the larger the, the, the average size of the neurons, so the smaller the neuronal density, the larger the average size of the neurons, the more glial cells you have per neuron. And uh, this applies to entire cerebral cortex and the, the entire other structures. Let me just show you quickly um, some um, unpublished data that, that we just finished. This is looking um, at human cortex cut into a series of coronal sections, and section by section here, you see that neuronal density varies quite, uh, quite a lot. It starts at, a, uh, at some value here, seems to decrease as you, go, as you go posteriorly, and then it increases again. The glia to neuron ratio varies enormously along the same, along the same axis, but if you look at the glia or non-neuronal to neuronal ratio as a function of neuronal density, you find exactly the same relationship. So this relationship even applies within the cerebral cortex across different, different structures. So it looks like a, a, a very fundamental property of the, of the tissue. Now, what could this relationship be um, important to? For, or where does it come from? The usual argument is that larger neurons are accompanied by more glial cells because they need more glial cells to support their metabolic um, function, which, like uh, the discussion was going here before, that's uh, Simon Leffling's estimate that larger neurons would need more energy to sustain their their function because not only of an increased membrane surface, increased number of synaptic contacts, but supposedly also because of increased rates of synaptic activity. So larger neurons would, should need more glia because larger neurons should need more energy. But now that we had, that's an estimate, now that we actually had numbers, we could look directly at these, this relationship and determine how does metabolic cost scale with the number of neurons. And that's exactly the question that was being referred to here before. So we pulled out data from the literature. You have data on glucose consumption per gram of tissue in different species, per minute of tissue by the, by the whole brain. And now we can compare that directly to the number, total number of neurons in the brains of these species. And if you divide the total glucose used per minute by the number of neurons, you end up with an, an estimate, an average estimate, of the neuronal cost per minute. And in micromoles of glucose per neuron per minute, these numbers here seem damn constant to me. It's, you have a variation of 0 0.4 times here. Now, if you look at the, this glucose use per neuron minute, as a function of neuronal density across these six species, there's no clear relationship here, uh, no relationship with brain size either. And instead, what you find is that the total amount of glucose that each of these brains consumes is a simply linear function of how many neurons that brain has. Um, what this implies is that larger brains, uh, I mean, sorry, Brains with more neurons, regardless of how large those neurons are, regardless of how large that brain is, 
um, the more neurons you have, the more energy your brain is going to cost. And, and that is because, on average, the metabolic cost per neuron actually does not change. So while this is less than what Simon Laughlin would have predicted, let me just remind you, it's actually more than what applies for every other tissue in the body where you do find metabolic rates to go down as cells become larger, larger as, as tissues and bodies become larger. Apparently, the only, the, other, the, the only other known exception to that rule was skeletal muscle. So apparently, muscle fibers and neurons have, relative, have constant meta, uh, metabolic rates per cell. So final question then. Now, if the, is the human brain actually larger than expected for its, for its body? I mean, how, how come is the human brain so much larger than we would expect it to be? Uh, and this expected, I should point out, comes mostly from comparisons with great apes that can get to be even three times larger than we are, and yet their brain is about a third of what ours is. And um, with that being larger than you would expect, the human brain also seems to be more expensive than others. So why is that? And uh, we can, now that, uh, now that we can estimate that the amount of energy that a brain costs is just a simple linear function of how many neurons it has, regardless of its size, regardless of its body size, then there's a fairly simple answer to that question. The human brain costs so much energy at something that we can estimate at six kilocalories per billion neurons per day just because it has an enormous number of neurons. So in this sense, our brain actually costs just as much energy as would be expected of a mammalian brain given these rules that uh, if, if these rules that we found also apply to all of them. So last question, why doesn't the larger primate also have the largest brain around? Um, why is ours the biggest and not, not gorillas or actually mostly gorillas? And um, from when, when I started thinking about metabolism, it occurred to me that, well, maybe it's just because it, gorillas cannot afford both. Maybe you can only afford either a very large body or a very large number of neurons in the brain. So how do we come about, how do we answer this question? First thing is to uh, determine whether great ape brains are also made the same way as ours are. And um, although we haven't been able to find any great ape cortices to, to analyze, we did have cerebella to work with. And uh, the interesting thing is that these mathematical relationships um, between numbers of neurons and the different structures and with the brain are so precise across species that we can from, know, from knowing the number of neurons that compose the gorilla and the orangutan cerebella, we can expect, uh, we can predict how large the, the whole brain of the, orang of the orangutan and of the gorilla would be and how many neurons the whole brain should have and how large the, the, their body should be compared to other non-grade A primates. And we find that um, we can predict very well the total brain size of these two species simply from the number of, of neurons that they have in the cerebellum, which suggests that uh, the brains of these two species are also made according to the same neuronal scaling rules that we found to apply to other primates. What doesn't match is the, the expected size. So these animals seem to have much larger body sizes than one would expect for the size of the, of the brain that they have. So. Um, given that uh, they also, their brain also scales in size the same way that um, other primates do, then how do, we, how do we determine whether what kind of metabolic impact that has on the, on the animal's um, survival capabilities, let's say, related to, to metabolism? So what we did, and this was Karina's uh, work in the lab as an undergraduate, I should say, so what, what we did was uh, calculate for each of these species, for each, each primate species for which we had numbers of neurons, we calculated from Kleiber's law, which relates total body metabolic cost to body size. We calculated the body only related uh, cal caloric need. So that's discounting the size of the brain, which is actually very little, so it hardly makes any difference. And we calculated directly the brain-related caloric need from those six kilocalories per billion neurons per day. 
and we compare that to the daily caloric intake for each animal. Um, now, so this is, here you have how much calorie, how much energy you have coming in and how much you have to use from that. From, from, from that. But um, the daily caloric intake, actually you can, you can expect it to also depend on how large your body is. Just intuitively, the larger the, an animal is, the more it should be able to eat per time, right? Um, we heard Ken talk about something related to that yesterday. So we, we then looked at how the daily caloric intake scales for primates with body mass, and that's uh, calculated from the daily feeding hours reported in the literature. And this is what you find, that the energy intake per hour for a primate scales with, with body mass. And I should add here that this is non-human primates that live on raw food diets. And here you find this is, um, this is the relationship that you find, um, so larger animals are able of taking in more calories per hour, but at a rate that increases only with the square root of body mass, which means that these animals are going to hit a wall at some point if body size increases faster than the amount of calories that, they're gonna, that they'll be able to, to eat. And uh, you can actually limit, uh, you can actually calculate that the limit, the upper uh, body mass that a primate could theoretically support if it ate uh, what we, we assume here to be a maximum of 12 hours of feeding, it, a primate could, could not be larger than 344 kilograms. But uh, so if you, if you calculate now, if you take into consideration all three variables, how large your body is, so how much energy you need to sustain your body. How many neurons you have, so how much energy you need to sustain your neurons. And how large you are, which determines how much energy you can, um, can be your intake to support that given combination of body size and number of neurons. You find these viability curves each of them for a certain number of feeding hours per day. And let me just color these to make it easier to, to see. So what you, what, you, what you find here is that if a primate eats eight hours a day, it can only afford a certain, com uh, <laughs> certain combinations of body mass and number of numbers of neurons. Eating eight hours per day, a primate could not have anything close to 100 billion neurons, and it could not weigh around 100 kilograms. To, to afford a body of 100 kilograms, a primate has to eat something bet between 8 and 10 hours per day. And still, it's not going to be able to afford much more than 80 billion neurons. If you follow the curve here, 80 billion to afford something like 80 billion neurons, a primate would have to have a body mass eating 10 hours per, per day it would be around here. It could only have a body mass of about 60 kilograms, but that would cost eating 10 hours per day. So, um, you can look at that, at that, the trade-off between body size and how many, how many neurons the brain would have in a different way. So this is, these are the curves, the viability curves to have 90 billion neurons. It would, that's only affordable at these combinations here. A body mass smaller than 100 something kilograms, but uh, certainly more than 10 hours of eating per day, if not more, 11 or so. So if you look at human evolution, where would, it, from the fossil record, from what we know about the combinations of body size and uh, cranial capacity, so the estimated numbers of neurons that we can uh, predict from the relationships that we found. Um, look at these. These are, this is chimpanzee here, the, um, orangutan and gorilla. You find that they're, all of them are been, uh, underneath the, the, the 10 hour a day uh, feeding time which, by the way, seems to be some sort of practical limit. Gorillas that already feed about 10 hours a day, they have a hard time keeping, ma maintaining their body weight when in, uh, during dry season, whenever there's, for whatever, for whatever uh, reason, scarcity of foods. And you find that um, um, Australopithecus was about here, um, Homo hab uh, habilis and erectus is still predicted to be be below that curve. But um, Heidelbergensis, ne ne Neanderthalensis, and Sapiens are certainly above the curve, which means that if we had the same diet as living uh, great apes and other primates, we would have to spend 
over 11 hours of our day foraging, eating, looking for food, which we certainly don't do. And I think you know the answer. Why don't we spend 11 plus hours a day eating or foraging? That's because we can cook our foods. And uh, that's one that's, that's actually my favorite theory. It's not my theory, not my hypothesis. Uh, it's uh, Richard Wrangham who um, has the most evidence for this, that uh, it was uh, Homo erectus. Uh, the major change in brain size happened in, within this species, Homo erectus, at, at the same time as it learned not to use fire, not to eat meat, but to do the two things together, to use fire to modify the, the, the foods that it had available. So let me just summarize. What we have found from looking at numbers of neurons is, is that in evolution, neurons have been added to brains in different manners. So brain size varies as different functions of numbers of neurons across mammalian orders. Non-neuronal cells, on the other hand, seem to have been added uh, to, to be added at pretty much the same, in pretty much the same manner at, for at least the last 90, billion, 90 million years of evolution in, that, uh, in those branches. And so we, we should, I think we should think of brain size as a, not as a determinant of anything, but rather as a consequence of these, of some um, order-specific and structure-specific unique ways of adding neurons to, to brain structures and other conserved uh, ways of adding non-neuronal cells to the, to the structures. And the consequence of these combinations is that size by itself can be a very, very misleading parameter. And instead, we, we should be looking directly at numbers of neurons. And maybe there we will finally have what accounts for humans being remarkable without being extraordinary in the sense of not being an exception to, to any rule. Maybe the reason why we can do so well is simply because, one, we're primates, so we have a, a very economical way of adding neurons to our brains. And two, within primates, we um, are the ones who, have, who are fortunate to have a modified diet that allows us to support a very large number of neurons that others cannot. So we can conclude that the human brain actually has the number of neurons expected for a primate of its brain size. It, uh, it has gained neurons coordinately in the cortex and the cerebellum. So the relative expansion of the cerebral cortex is just size, really, in a way. Maybe it's, it's really just for show. Um, it, um, and, but it does, it has gained neurons jointly in the, in the cerebral cortex and cerebellum faster than in the, the underlying, uh, the, the, the other structures. So maybe that, that, that is um, a mechanism for added complexity and flexibility. It costs a lot of energy simply because it has a lot of neurons. Um, and in that sense, it costs just what you would expect of a brain with its number of neurons. And it's, it costs actually so much that it could not be afforded on a raw food uh, diet. But on a cooked diet, um, we can not only su sustain metabolically body and a large number of brain neurons, but that actually frees time so that we can actually use all those numbers of neurons that now can be afforded to do much more interesting things than just forage and look for food, like, for instance, sit and talk about what the things that we can do with our large number of neurons and how they came about, and all that thanks to your favorite cooked food supplier. So let me just thank the people who did this last part of the work directly, Karina. All the work in, on primates was, uh, is done in collaboration with John, Christine Collins, and Payan in his lab. Um, and I showed you a number of other things that have involved a very large number of people. And I'm really thankful to all of them. Ken Patani is here. And these are the people in the lab who are pushing this forward now. Thank you so much for your attention.